Turing 6502. The Stack. I'm Dr. Matt Regan. No, not the knack, the stack. In this video, we'll go over what the stack is and look at the push and pull instructions. Then in the next video, we'll look at one of the main reasons for having a stack, which is subroutine calls. Here's our Turing 6502 architecture, which I'm hoping is becoming pretty familiar. And you'll notice that there's no specific hardware designed to handle a stack. We just have the main Apple II RAM and our 6502 notepad. And it's in this notepad that we have a variable that represents the stack pointer. The actual 6502 architecture, on the other hand, does have a dedicated stack pointer. And this is a hardware implemented register. Stacks were initially mentioned by Turing, but they're most directly accredited to Klaus Samuelson and Frederick Bauer from the Technical University of Munich. They patented the idea back in the 50s. You might be wondering, what is the stack on the 6502? Well, it's a region of memory in page one. This region can still be used as general memory, but there's some dedicated hardware that treats it like a stack, specifically the 8-bit stack pointer, which will only reference addresses in this page. The stack actually starts at the top of the page at address location 1FF, and it works down from this location. One of the main instructions that uses the stack is push A. This writes the value of the accumulator into a memory location in page 1, and the address of this location is determined by the stack pointer. Once we've done the main memory write, we automatically decrease the stack pointer by 1. Pushing to the stack wouldn't be much good unless we could retrieve the data, and that's what the pull instruction's for. It's essentially the opposite of push. We increment stack pointer and read from the main memory, again using the address pointed to in page 1 by the stack pointer. There are also special instructions for pushing and pulling the status register. Stacks are often used for subroutine calls, but they're also helpful with arithmetic. When I was at school many years ago, we used to call this BOMDAS, and that's just a way of remembering the order of operation. Brackets first. So in the top line, without the brackets, we do the multiplication first, and then add 2 to get 17. But in the bottom line, we add 2 and 3 first, then multiply by 5 to get 25. Let's look at the top example first. We can rewrite this in a form known as postfix, which is also called reverse Polish notation. There was a famous Hewlett Packard calculator from the 80s and 90s which operated this way. What this tells us is that we can compute this value by pushing 235 onto the stack, then performing a multiply and an add. Now we can take the term stack quite literally. Here I'm going to use a stack of plates. We can see the stack, but we only really have access to the top element on the stack. We presume there's already important information on the stack, so we don't want to touch that. But the first thing we want to do is we want to push 2, which means we put a plate with the number 2 on the stack. Next, we push 3, and then push 5. And then we see this time symbol. This tells us to take the top two elements off the stack, perform the multiplication, and push the result back onto the stack. Now we see the plus symbol. This means we take the top two elements of the stack, perform the addition, and push the result back onto the stack. You'll see the result of the calculation, 17, is on top of the stack. I can also compute the alternate version of this equation with the stack. There's a reverse Polish notation form for this. First, I push the 2 plate onto the stack, then the 3 plate onto the stack. The plus symbol tells me I need to take off the two top elements of the stack, add them together, and push the result back onto the stack, which is a 5 in this case. Next, I push another 5 onto the stack. I see the multiply symbol. That tells me to take the two top elements off the stack, multiply them together, and push the result back onto the stack which is 25 in this case. In both of these examples, I operated from left to right on the reverse Polish notation form, which is generally what I want to do with machine instructions. But by using the stack, I was able to get the right result. And the important thing is, it doesn't really matter how many brackets I have. Provided my stack's big enough, I can handle an arbitrarily large number of brackets. 
Back to the 6502. Push and pull are all single byte instructions, and this is where they occur in the instruction set. Let's walk through an actual example. I have a push instruction at 94F7, and this tells me to push the value of A onto the stack. I load the value of the stack pointer into the EAL register, and I load the constant 1 into EAH. This is reflected in the memory address registers, and it points to address 1E2. The value of 0 in the accumulator overwrites the value of 61 that's already at that address. Then we decrement the stack pointer and move on to the next instruction. I add them into the switch statement where I perform decode. The code for this is pretty straightforward. Move SP into EAL, 1 into EAH. Store the value of A at this address, and then decrement the stack pointer. We add these instructions as arcs out of rule 28. Then in our state machine for the actual instruction, we load 1 into EAH. But for transferring SP into EAL, I've chosen to do it one nibble at a time, and the main reason for this is to save space in the rulebook. I read the stack pointer, I convert it into one of 16 states, 7103 to 7118, then based on the state, I write the lower four bits into EAL. Then I just repeat the process for the upper four bits. I store the value of A at its memory location, and then I decrement SP. Let's have a look at it running on the actual machine. Here we can see the instruction fetch and 4 h the opcode for push A. Now we see it running through a number of states in the low 7100 range. We do the main memory write to 1E2 and then move on to the next instruction. Pushing the status register is almost identical. The only difference is the register pointed to coming into rule 7176. Now let's look at pull A. There's a pull A instruction at 951B, and we essentially want to do the reverse of push. So we increment the stack pointer, load it into EAL, and then load the constant 1 into EAH. This gets reflected in the memory address registers also. We then look up this address, 1E2. We find the value of 0 there, and we write this into the accumulator. For this instruction, we also update the negative and zero flags. The C code for doing this is pretty straightforward. We increment the stack pointer, load it into EAL, load one into EAH, perform a main memory read from this location, put the result into the accumulator, and update the flags. And then we essentially do the same thing in our state machine. Load EAH, increment stack pointer, copy the value of the stack pointer into EAL, four bits at a time, perform a main memory read into the accumulator, and then set the appropriate flags. For the PHP instruction, which is pull status register, we do the main memory read into the status register, so we don't really want to update the flags, they've already just been updated. To see that this actually occurs, let's have a look at the Turing 6502 performing the pull A instruction. We can see the opcode fetch 68, which is pull A, it then runs through a number of states in the 7000 range. It performs a main memory read from location 1E2. It puts the result in the accumulator, updates the status register, and then goes and fetches the next instruction. That's it for the push and pull instructions. Next video, we'll look at jump to subroutine and return from subroutine. But for now, like, share, and subscribe.